Thanks for coming. So uh, my, uh, my group uh, mostly focus on uh, the methodology and the mathematics of different settings of machine learning, uh, you know, uh, deep learning, representation learning, giant models, reinforcement, and so on and so forth. And one of the main topics we care about is understanding deep learning. So I guess I don't have to tell you too much about you know, uh, how many breakthroughs deep learning has made uh, in the last uh, of, you know, few years. So you know, deep learning has made you know, breakthroughs in vision, you know, robotics, natural language processing, and all of this involves some kind of like deep neural networks. So, um, and we care particularly about you know, understanding deep learning and why we uh, care about that. So the, I think what understanding of deep learning can offer um, um, could be threefold. So the first one is that, you know, obviously, if you understand what deep learning techniques are doing, then we can, uh, you know, provide mathematical guarantees, justifications, uh, interpretations of uh, deep learning techniques. We can know, you know, better what's going on really inside of these AI algorithms. And uh, these are not only only for like you know the social uh, aspect of you know deep learning like uh, you know of course you know if we can have interpretations that would be great for social aspects uh, but also like these are uh, also very useful for uh, engineers and researchers to develop you know future deep learning algorithms so for example you know um, you know with you know more mathematical understanding I think we can uh, uh, you know prevent and diagnose and treat the potential failures of deep learning uh, in a more proper way so in many cases I guess you know, when engineers apply deep learning to a new use case, um, you know, uh, it's like, you know, even though sometimes it's just that off the shelf algorithm works great, still there are a lot of, uh, you know, improvement, uh, room of improvement if you, you know, tune your algorithms in the proper way. And, uh, and also, like, a lot of failures actually can be prevented in advance if uh, some of these, you know, uh, designs of the system, the algorithms could be, you know, done uh, better in the early stage so we can strategize, you know, earlier uh, instead of, like, you know, fix the issues later. So I think all of this, you know, could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, done better if we understand deep learning in a more principled way. And, uh, you know, and finally, I think, you know, all of this leads us to uh, the design of new uh, efficient and principled algorithms. So this is not only about understanding, but also about designing new principled algorithms that can solve the problems much better. So uh, I guess just to um, uh, you know, show a little bit you know, why kind of understanding deep learning system uh, algorithms is difficult uh, and why it's important. So um, I think let me talk a little bit about you know, the deep learning uh, kind of pipelines, the typical pipelines to apply this kind of uh, uh, algorithms uh, for a new use case. So I guess you know, this is only the high level kind of modules uh, we need to go through. So I guess you know, the first step often you start with is uh, problem formulation. So you want to first you know, so, uh, formulate a problem as a, for example, supervised learning problem, unsupervised learning problem, or reinforcement learning problem, and then um, you, know, you can you know, collect some data uh, to, to start your training, or you could use some of the existing data or repurpose some of the existing data. And then you know, we can uh, uh, design our models, you know, the architectures, um, you know, these are kind of neural networks in most of the cases, and then we have to train our neural networks based on the data we have collected, and finally we also have to test right, the performance, you know, on, on, on all different kind of scenarios. So I guess, um, you know, deep learning mostly refers to this middle module where we kind of go deeper uh, with, uh, with neural networks. Um, but the, you know, this solves a lot of problems. You know, this makes the performance much, much better. But as a consequence, uh, this, you know, uh, the change of this module uh, you know, affects a lot of the other modules as well. So you know, if you use a deeper model uh, in your architecture, then you have to also do other things you know, differently to accommodate uh, the change of the whole system. So you have to probably use a different optimizer when you train. You'll probably have to collect data in a different way. You have to regularize your model, so on and so forth. And moreover, I think the subtlety here is that this is never a straightforward like a pipeline. Like you go through from left to right and do all of these you know, things, you know, and then you know, everything got solved. So in many cases, you know, even for experts, you know, we have to go back and back and forth, you know, between all of these modules. For example, if we see the algorithms doesn't work as well as we expected, then we have to go back to think about you know, what goes wrong. 
Or is it that like our data was not good? Or is it like our models were not good? Or maybe the way of formulating the problem limited our potential. Maybe we should collect you know, different data and, and view the problems in a different way, um, you know, so on and so forth. So I think uh, uh, this, you know, you know, all of these kind of uh, interactions of these modules, pro um, you know, create you know, additional kind of difficulties in applying deep learning algorithms in a best way. You know, even though we probably if you just use the off-the-shell algorithm that encapsulates all of these modules, then they can work okay, but still there are a lot of rooms of improvements. And, uh, and my vision is that we have to understand each of these modules, but also their interactions with each other. And you'll see that these interactions um, uh, can be very uh, uh, fruitful to kind of uh, understand and leverage. So, and if we can do this, then uh, we can provide justifications and guarantees for each module, and we can provide probably guarantees for the whole kind of uh, overall result, and, uh, you know, we can strategize better, you know, we can probably, you know, before we even started this kind of costly process of, you know, going back and forth between all of these stages, we could, you know, design our data collection process better so that we don't have to redo it again, which is, could be costly uh, in, um, to, to redo. Uh, and, and we can also fix issues, you know, in more efficient ways. And, and, and at the end of the day, I think the goals are, you know, really doing this, you know, much better. Um, you know, in a technical point, from a practical point of view, we want to design, you know, more accurate models. We like to, you know, speed up our algorithms. We like to, you know, improve the data efficiency so that we can use as few data, you know, as possible. And probably we also want to, you know, improve the reliability of uh, all of these, you know, modules and so on and so forth. So uh, I guess I will give um, a few, uh, uh, three vignettes about, you know, some of the past research I have been done with my group. Uh, and, uh, and this shows some of these, you know, philosophies here. Um, so I guess the first vignette I'm gonna show is probably the most technical one, um, but there are only two slides, so please bear with me. So I guess, you know, here we care about, you know, the particular training process of all of these deep learning model. I guess, you know, probably, some of you know that you know, when you do AI, you know, using machine learning, what you do is that you fit some model to your data, and this requires some kind of optimization algorithm uh, on, uh, doing this. And this is, in most of the cases, uh, the most time consuming and engineering consuming, uh, engineering effort consuming part, because you know, some of these you know, algorithms have to run like, for weeks to, to get some reasonable results. So, and, and you know, the obvious question uh, we'd like to ask is, you know, how do we train much faster uh, than the, the current techniques? Can we speed up? And this means, you know, speeding up the algorithm not only means that you can provide users better, uh, you know, like uh, a better, um, better uh, experience, but also means that in the, in the in-house, you know, development stages, uh, you can uh, save a lot of GPU compute time, uh, which means saving a lot of money. And also this saves a lot of engineering uh, time as well. So, um, and another related and, you know, uh, way to ask uh, the training question is whether we can uh, have a different functions, different models that can be easier uh, to train uh, than the existing uh, techniques. And uh, another kind of question uh, that we care about here in the training process is its relationship with the testing, right? So we realize that sometimes, you know, you can train your model very well to fit your existing data set, but, uh, but the model doesn't work well for future test scenarios. So we ask the question, how do we train these models so that you can have better guarantees or better possibility to uh, generalize uh, to future test scenarios when the, you know, the test scenarios are different or somewhat different from uh, the training examples. And, and you know, we can also ask the question, you know, uh, what, you know, what we can do if there are noise in our training data set is it the way, the right way to do it is that we should denoise by human labors or we should use algorithms to automatically denoise some of these examples. So I guess to, just to show the kind of, the, the, the subtlety here uh, in all of these algorithms. So this is a very simple plot, you know, I can do it like uh, on my laptop, you know, um, and train down, you know, this is like a trend on some image data set CIFAR. So, so here there are two algorithms. Um, the bottom line here is that, you know, if you use a faster training algorithm that can fit your data better uh, in a much you know, faster way, it doesn't really mean that the algorithm can work well when you test it on the test examples. So here uh, I have algorithm one and two, I, you know, let me not tell you exactly what they're doing, doing but they are, they're only different by a little bit, very, very little, one hyperparameter. And uh, you can see that the second algorithm, uh, the orange one, uh, it trains much faster, the train error. Uh, the lower the better, so the train error goes down much faster, but at the end of the day, 
uh, the test error, the, the, the thing that you really care about, uh, actually is not as good as, uh, as, the, as the green one. So these are kind of things that we want to fix. We want to have algorithms that only train faster, but also can work well for the test examples. Um, so just to give one you know, concrete example on you know, what we have been doing uh, in this kind of uh, space, so this is one recent work that we have done about simpl simplifying deep learning architectures so that we can train faster and generalize equally well. So um, in particular, we are removing these techniques, so-called technique batch norm, which you, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't know it. Uh, it's a complex technique uh, that is useful, uh, empirically useful, um, but uh, the working, uh, it's working is not well understood. So, um, so this is, a, you know, and also these techniques, though it works, you know, better uh, empirically, but it creates uh, engineering issues and difficulties. You know, for example, if you have, you know, multiple machines, uh, you know, when you train parallelly, then you have to do do special kind of like, a, you know, uh, uh, programming kind of like a, a treatment to kind of accommodate these kind of techniques, which could be, you know, very complicated to do uh, in many scenarios. And sometimes it's impossible to do them. Um, and, and these techniques, you know, often work well for vision, but not very well for uh, NLP. So, um, so, so the goal here is to simplify deep learning by removing these kind of uh, techniques so that we can still do as well as, uh, as with them, so that you know, we save the engineering issue and potentially we can do uh, well on NLP tasks as well. So, uh, and uh, our recent work, you know, proposed a simple solution uh, which fixed the problem. I would not tell you exactly what we do it, Pretty much, the you know this is derived by some mathematical you know uh, derivations, uh, and and pretty much the end, at the end of the day, the only thing we change is uh, the initialization of these kind of architectures in a slightly sophisticated way. So um, and if you do this, then the training becomes much better here. Again, the lower the better, and and the testing you know is uh, as as well as without batch norm, and we don't need all of these, these kind of engineering uh, problems. And also we have you know results on. Uh, in the NLP domain where we show that, you know, you, if you use this kind of normalization and this kind of, you know, fix up techniques uh, for uh, machine translation tasks, we can also improve uh, the accuracies uh, in those machine translation tasks. Right, so this is the, the, the first vignette about, you know, how do we kind of like understand training and also improve based on our insights from the, the understanding. And uh, let me move on to the second vignette where uh, we wanted to understand the modeling uh, uh, aspect of machine learning. So by modeling, I mean that how do we use, you know, uh, model all of these kind of concepts that we see in the real world and, and use, uh, you know, kind of like a, a mathematical models to, to, to learn them. So, so particularly, I'm gonna talk about, you know, our uh, work on uh, understanding uh, word vectors. So, uh, so, so, you know, I think some of you, some of you may have heard of these word vectors, which store the semantic information of words in vectors, which is a mathematical concept um, that can be understood by the computer. So concretely, you want to encode a word, which is just several letters, uh, into a vector, and this vector could be high dimension. Here, I only have four dimensions, and it's just a, you know a sequence of elements, you know, of uh, scalars. And, uh, and these vectors uh, are the kind of the mathematical uh, objects you are going to uh, use uh, in the computer program. So um, it turns out that you cannot, you, um, you cannot only just you know, encode the words, but you can also encode uh, relations and other kind of concepts uh, into the vectors in a meaningful uh, way. So here is a one example um, where um, uh, you can encode you know, words and relationships simultaneously in the geometry uh, in a, uh, in a, in, with a geometrical structure. So here you can see that uh, so each dot is the encoding of the word, say, in a three-dimensional space or two-dimensional space in this case. So Italy and France and G Germany, they all have you know, associated dots, and they are, because they are kind of words that have similar semantic meaning, they are all about countries, so they have um, uh, encodings or embeddings or vectors uh, that are very similar to each other. They are close to each other. And uh, Rome, uh, Paris, and Berlin, these are all you know, words about countries, uh, capitals, and they have similar uh, vectors in the space. And moreover, um, this uh, country uh, capital uh, relationship can be uh, decoded from the, can be encoded in the direction, right? So this direction seems to encode that, uh, encodes the uh, country capital relationship, right? If you give me the vector for Italy, then if you just go in that direction, you will see the corresponding um, uh, capital of the, of the country, Italy. 
So these are wonderful techniques developed by the papers uh, Word to Work and Glove. And actually, Glove is uh, developed by um, uh, Chris Manning's, Professor Chris Manning's team here. Uh, and we are interested in understanding you know, more fundamentally uh, why this can, can, can work and how do we you know, make them uh, um, better. So um, I guess uh, to some extent, that kind of understanding is kind of like, uh, it's really a way to link the semantic uh, information uh, about the words to the mathematical structures of the word vectors, right? This is what we want to achieve, right? We want to kind of make a kind of like a, uh, a connection between these two concepts, and the way that we do it is through the correlations between the words. So, um, so actually, has been well understood that uh, the meanings of a word somewhat kind of uh, is determined by uh, the words it co-occurs with. This is the famous quote by Harris and uh, uh, Fifth dates back to uh, that dates back to 1950s. And what we have done is to kind of make the connections between the correlation of the words uh, to the mathematical structures of these word vectors. And the way that we do it is that we derive certain probabilistic models for languages, and using these probabilistic models and mathematics, we can uh, make these connections formal and, uh, and interesting. And we have used this kind of like uh, 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 mathematical, you know, probabilistic models for languages to derive, you know, more uh, interesting uh, uh, vectors uh, uh, or, or encodings of uh, different other kind of concepts in language. For example, we can encode uh, the, the meanings into vectors. So here, um, the goal is that, you know, the kind of like a uh, uh, the kind of questions we are interested in is that if you have a polysemous word, right, a word with multiple meanings, say if you have a word high, then it has multiple meanings, then probably doesn't make sense to have a single vector in a computer program to represent this word. So because um, you know, probably want to have uh, different vectors for different program, uh, for different meanings of this word. And, uh, and in particular, what we can achieve is that we can, for example, take pi as an example, uh, what we can achieve is that uh, we have uh, uh, vectors for each of the meanings of Thai. I say Thai have five meanings, has five meanings. And we can have this mathematical correspondence between uh, the vectors of Thai and the vectors of each of its meanings. So, uh, so the vectors of Thai is actually a sum of the vectors of each of these meanings. So and this can go both ways, right? So if you know the vector of Thai, you can decompose it into different meanings. So this means that if you give me a vector, or if you give me a word, I can first transfer um, transform it into the vector and then decompose it into different vectors so that I can understand the different meanings of this word. And, and it can also go the other way so that you know, if you have a collection of meanings and you can find the corresponding word uh, that, have, uh, that has uh, these meanings. And in particular, just to show an example, so for Thai, the kind of meanings we have discovered uh, are, are these. So these are uh, meanings that are visualized by uh, words that have the same meanings. So the first column seems to about the meanings of ties uh, in clothes, and the second and third column seems to be about uh, the meaning of you know, tying uh, in games, and actually they are about slightly different level, right? So the second column seems to be about you know, tying uh, in the whole season, and the third column seems to be about tying in the particular game, and the fourth column uh, seems to be about you know, uh, the, the, tie, the action tie uh, as you know, like a wiring. And we thought sometimes, you know, the, the last column seems to be spurious, something like we found by mistake, but then we realized that this is, seems to be about, you know, the, the tie uh, in the context of musical events, which also has a um, uh, slightly different meanings. Right, we can, and, and another, you know, feature of all of this is that these are only trained uh, from uh, Wikipedia documents. We don't have any prior knowledge about all of these meanings. We uh, now do linguistics, and I don't even, I'm not even a native English speaker, so, um, so all of these are trained only using, um, uh, uh, you know, documents uh, uh, available online, um, like the Wikipedia documents. And uh, we also ex you know, extend this kind of ideas uh, based on the, the probabilistic models we developed for language to uh, other situations. For example, we can cluster words uh, with similar meanings, uh, and we can do this kind of hierarchical cluster. So let me just explain what this graph is doing. So basically, this, each of these purple small cluster is a cluster of words about a specific small uh, areas of uh, science. So, and, and all of these labels are you know, labeled by ourselves. So we, what we only found is a cluster of words, and then we found that all of these clusters are meaningful. For example, the first column here is all the words about logic, and the fourth one is all the 
words about you know polymer. And you know some of this label we have to Google online to kind of understand some of these words by ourselves to understand you know what's the meaning of each of these cluster. You know I mean, the clusters is found by the uh, by the computer and we uh, we give the labels uh, based on our own knowledge. And we also found that these kind of clusters can be uh, organized hierarchically so that um, you know this kind of small topics in math you know is you know clustered into a bigger topic uh, math and and all of these topics can have you know. Um, you know, overlapping, you know, uh, cluster. So, like overlapping uh, overlaps. For example, mathematical physics belongs to both the cluster math and physics. Uh, and again, these are only trained on Wikipedia uh, doc documents. So, uh, I guess you know, in general, the the general uh, kind of philosophy, uh, kind of general kind of um, uh, phenomenon here is that we can vectorize different kind of concepts uh, um, in uh, you know. In our human life uh, into kind of like uh, um, you know vectors that uh, that can be understood by humans. For example, if you don't not only care about the word but also meanings, sentences, documents, or individuals or products, uh, you can vectorize all of this. You know, um, and uh, and have vectors that can be understood by by machines. So so in some sense, we transform the concept understood by humans into the concept understood by, uh, that can be understood by machines. And I think the important feature here is that you know with some of these you know uh, mathematical techniques, we can um, you know these kind of uh, vectors are not only understood by machines, but also we understand why how machines understand them. So so we know how machines are operating all of these vectors, so that we can kind of intervene and, and know what we are doing. All right. So the third vignette I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, some work uh, in reinforced learning and especially the, the methodology of reinforced learning. So um, I guess you know the typical kind of uh, idea of reinforced learning is that one way to think about it is that you kind of iterate between uh, the data collection process and the training and optimization process. So this here, the kind of the interactions between these modules come into play. For example, when you uh, learn how to play Go, so the the the, the algorithm. The way that the algorithm works is that uh, the algorithm self plays with it, it, itself. So um, you know when it self plays, it's kind of like a data collection process. Mm -hmm. It collects all of this, you know, replay of each of these games, and then based on all of this replay, uh, the, uh, the the computer program improves themselves by optimizing the policy. So. Um, so the data collection process, you know, is basically you try the strategy and collect feedbacks, and the optimization process is improving uh, the strategy based on the feedbacks and uh, you have uh, you have got, right? So and uh, the, this idea works pretty well, you know, for Go. You know, we have seen all of the breakthroughs about AlphaGo, um, but the uh, the limitation for now is that they require uh, a lot of you know trials and samples, right? So the the Alpha Go and Alpha Zero, all of these versions of you know Go uh, about, uh, they have to uh, you know learn how to play Go using a million or tens of millions of you know uh, games to 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 beat human um, beings. So, but this you know doesn't seem to be uh, applicable for uh, robotic applications where you cannot let the robot. To you know, simulate. You cannot let the robots to run, you know, forever to collect all of these, you know, uh, uh, trajectories, all of these uh, uh, robots. So, um, so they are not very sample efficient uh, for robotic application, just because you know the robots cannot run, uh, you know, faster than certain speed. We don't have GPUs, uh, um, uh, you know, for robots. Um, so, so here is a, you know. Uh, uh, a new idea, um, you know, a, a recently, you know, uh, underexplored idea about, you know, improving uh, the sample efficiency of uh, reinforced learning. It's called model-based reinforced learning. So the kind of key idea here is that we have um, uh, a set different, you know, kind of module, uh, a way to interact between these, you know, two uh, modules. So we model the dynamics and the physical uh, mechanisms of the world to anticipate the future. So what does this mean is that, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, in the data collection process, you don't collect the, the the feedbacks, right? You don't collect whether you win the game or not, but you also collect uh, the observations about you know what happens in the future. So and this allows you to kind of understand uh, the the dynamics of the the, the world, the mechanisms of the world, much better. And so in the training, we learn some model dynamics, and also we improve the strategy not based on. The, the feedbacks we got from the data collection process. Here, we improve the strategy based on 
the anticip anticipation of the future. So basically, you imagine what will happen in the future, and you play this game in your mind um, in computer so that we don't have to try everything in the real world. So, so pretty much you build a simulator for the robot in your mind so that you can improve the robot, uh, the strategy uh, in, uh, in your mind based on the simulator of the robot. And then you improve your simulator you know, you know, based on the real observations. So, um, so the, the pros of this kind of approach is that they are more sample efficient. Sometimes it could be like 100 times more sample efficient. And they also generalize other to other tasks with the same environment much better. So here is just a demo. So uh, about you know how do we do this? Uh, um, so uh, so these are like uh, so basically we want we want to learn uh, in this kind of like a simple environment. We want to learn how to uh, go uh, to the right. So as I said, so the the way that we do it is that we have anticipation of the future. So on the left hand side, I'm going to show that what the computer program anticipates in the future. Uh, what, anticipate what happens in the future. And on the right hand side, we will see that what the humanoid does in reality. And, and you can see you know, what the, how this changes. Right? So this algorithm is an iterative algorithm. So the first thing I'm, I'm going to show is iteration 10. And you can see that um, the, um, the humanoid anticipates it can uh, walk forward and, and fail, uh, fall at some point. And, uh, and in reality, it also you know, fall but falls in a different way. So the anticipation of the future is not correct um, uh, in this case, uh, um, in, and, and neither the, the strategy. So this is only the beginning of the algorithm. And then let's see, now the humanoid anticipates a little bit better. You know, the strategy also improves. So uh, you can see it can work you know, for longer. But the anticipation is clearly wrong because you can see the food is actually under the ground. So it, the imagination is not, not correct. <laughs> so um, and uh, and indeed, you know, in reality, the uh, the robot, the humanoid, doesn't work as exactly uh, as it anticipates. So let's just fast forward and let's like look at eight, iteration eighty. And now let's play these two together. The left hand side is the anticipation, and the right hand side is the reality. So you can see that um, the the Im imagination is pretty accurate. S still not perfect but much more accurate than before. And the humanoid can also walk uh, you know, longer to the right. And at iteration 210, uh, you can see that uh, these algorithms, you know, both the, the prediction of the future and also the strategy becomes much better. Yeah. Yeah, it, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, these are some plots. Maybe we, I don't have time to show all of them. So the bottom line is that you know this is the first to achieve near optimal reward using the model-based reinforcement techniques with a single dynamical model, uh, and also this is the state-of-art performance when of, you know only one million uh, uh, samples are permitted. So one million still sounds pretty big, but this is uh, 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 already you know much better than the previous ones. You know, if you use the st um, previous algorithm, sometimes it takes like ten million uh, samples to uh, get such a uh, reward. And, and we have some ongoing work uh, to apply similar techniques to training uh, chatbot. You know, the chatbot is, you know, in, in some sense, you know, they are all, all, all bots, so you can do uh, similar techniques for both robot and chatbot. And this is some ongoing uh, work we have uh, been exploring. I guess as a summary, so um, we are interested in you know, developing efficient and principled um, deep learning te techniques, and our kind of approach is through mathematical understanding of deep learning and use that to inspire new design of uh, the new algorithms. And we care about different type of you know, criterions, um, criteria, like more accurate models, faster algorithms, sample efficiency, and, and robustness, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I guess uh, that's all I want to say. Thanks. Do we have any questions for Professor Ma? Very nice talk, thank you. Um, so when we look at the uh, training size for reinforcement learning, it tends to be very large. And then um, when we really look at the human learning, the babies, they try to just wobbly stand up first. And then you know after a while, they try to walk. So how do you? Um, provide a theoretical foundation to provide another level of abstraction so that 
but the the robot doesn't try to learn to walk first, but rather um, learn to stand. That's my question. Um, so, so I guess if I understand the question, I guess you you're asking uh, how how do we set up form formulations for different tasks, you know, learning not only just a single task, but for, you know, multiple tasks right, together, or like a, is that the question? Yeah, and do you believe it is more efficient to learn to stand first? I see. Yes, so I know whether there should be a cur curriculum on, you know, learning all of this. So uh, uh, definitely I believe, and actually this is somewhat what's happening uh, in some of these algorithms, right? So first of all, I think, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, first, you know, relating to you know what exactly what I talked about, you know, um, uh, I think you know babies probably they don't learn exactly by just trial and error. Sometimes they also predict what will happen. So this is probably all uh, what we are doing. You know, when we make you know strategies in the future, we don't just try the strategy and then say, okay, this strategy is bad, and then we try it again. Right. So we always you know plan, uh, you know, to we anticipate you know what will happen and then we change our strategy. So this is exactly what we are trying to do, and uh, and I think baby. Uh, it's also learning similarly, and and to um, and back to your question. So uh, I think babies learn different tasks, you know, and they probably it has a curriculum where right? it first learns to stand. Uh, I think this is somewhat encapsulated in some of these algorithms because you know if you want a humanoid to walk right, the first thing you have to do is to make sure it can somewhat uh, stand. So uh, and also we are trying all different ways to learn this kind of. Uh, in, in multi-task settings, for example, uh, when you have a model, you can use the same model to learn all different kind of tasks, not just a single task to walk right. So actually, um, uh, so I haven't, I don't have slides and videos here, but like if you learn uh, using our technique to walk right, then using the same anticipation, the word model, uh, you can also learn how to walk left. You know, it's not going to be super great, you know, but it's, it's pretty, pretty good. And there's no any samples you need. You don't need to try to walk right, left, because uh, you just anticipate that in the, uh, in, in, in the computer, and then uh, you can learn how to walk left without samples. I think last question right here. Hey, uh, my name is Suyash. I work at Oracle. I'm a big fan of deep learning, and I, I've been playing around with that a lot. And... Uh, I'm curious, because I've also heard the other side, the critiques of deep learning. Can you talk about the limitations of the technology? And since you're in the field, like what are the, what are the other research or other techniques you're seeing that will uh, disrupt deep learning and will come in, you know, it'll be something else like in the next five years? Uh, so what other techniques may destroy deep learning? So uh, I, I still have a lot of faith in deep learning. Uh, uh, I, you know, I do believe in deep learning. You know, that's why I'm studying it. Uh, but I think you know, there might be uh, ways to simplify deep learning. That's possible. Uh, and uh, my approach to do this is that you know, we first probably should understand deep learning, why it's working, and then we can you know, simplify uh, some of this you know, deep learning to make it probably shallower or probably, you know, more interpretable and simpler. And actually, that's part of the, what we are doing with this removing batch norm. So that's, uh, you know, complex techniques in deep learning, and we can uh, remove them now and it becomes, you know, simpler. You know, probably in the future, we can also make them even more simpler. <laughs>